Hello, everyone. Welcome to Climbing the Tech Career Ladder with Penn Mutual. I'm Chelsea Lowe, Program Coordinator for the for Drexel CCI's Corporate Partners Program, and I'm happy to introduce you to you today, one of our corporate partners, Penn Mutual. Before we get started, I want to thank you all for taking time to join us today, especially with the state of the world that we're in. Make sure you take time to breathe and practice whatever self-care looks like for you. I'm joining from West Philly, but I'm curious to know where everyone else is joining from. Feel free to say hello and put your location in the chat. Today's talk features Michael or Oral, Director of Web Development at Pim Mutual. Michael will be sharing his career journey and some advice on leadership development. After Michael's presentation, we'll open it up to Q&A. We'll use the chat, chat feature for that. Michael, I'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Chelsea. So, so I'm Michael Oral, like Chelsea said, the Director of Web Development for Penn Mutual. Um, Penn Mutual is a life insurance company. Um, in addition to life insurance policies, we sell annuities. Um, so basically they're both financial things that, um, you know, based on uh, how long somebody lives, either we pay somebody when they die or we pay someone until they die. It's uh, We work both sides of the coin right there. Company's 173 years old. We were founded in 1847. Um, me personally, I was founded in 1968, I'm 52 years old, um, and I've been coding for 43 years, which is a, a long time. So I've been in, I've seen a lot of things that have happened in the tech industry. Um, I started off with, you know, basic and assembler back in the days, moved on to Pascal C, C++, worked for Java for a decade and a half, and I've been working on a lot most recently for the last, you know, seven, eight years on web stuff, primarily, you know, JavaScript. And um, somewhere in the middle there, I was a journalist for a little over a decade, so working on mobile technology. So, just to go over what our agenda is going to look like, a uh, quick discussion, about 15 minutes. We're going to talk about um, leadership, uh, mentors, choosing your career, which you guys are already somewhat on the way to, and uh, job hopping. And then we'll take some questions at the end. So what is leadership? Uh, I'm gonna start off by saying what leadership isn't. Um, it's not about being right. It's not about um, telling other people what they should be doing. It's not even doing it all yourself. Um, the, the biggest thing for me that I've picked up over um, too many decades of working with people, both tech and not tech, is leadership requires empathy. You have to understand and be able to feel what the other person's thinking, see things from someone else's shoes. Um, you know, obviously as a tech person, there's the absolute right, correct way that you're interpreting this situation. But the thing is, not everybody thinks like you. And in order to be a leader in the tech industry, you have to be able to see things from the other side. Well, how is a non-technical person going to look at this? How's a marketing person going to look at this? How's a human resources person going to look at this? These are all things that are, um, quite important to get things done in business. And frankly, you can be the greatest technician in the world, um, but you're not gonna build a career out of it unless someone else values it. And in order to really do that, you, you have to understand the people you're, you're working with and for. Um, from my perspective, I think there's uh, two ways to show leadership as a, as a tech person. Um, doing so from the front. That's, I think, the, the, the more obvious thing. You know, you do the hard work. You're the, the engine of the team. You get things done. You ask good questions. You provide good answers when people um, ask you for things. Um, you provide help. You provide ideas. Um, you're the person that establishes relationships, that works the relationships, that makes sure the technology is working for people. You're that person that walks down the hall to have a two-minute conversation with someone face-to-face even though you could have just typed an email and even though that walk took longer than the conversation but that establishes your presence that that's gives you exposure to the rest of your company your business your cohorts whoever you're working with or for being out there and not being holed up in you know some cubicle somewhere in the dark um, coding or setting up network routers or whatever it is you do it's that face-to-face -face time it's the relationships it's the human aspect things all this stuff, leadership is human based. So doing so from the back, you know, there's certainly things you can do to help improve from the back without being the guy on the front line. You know, being a team player, 
you know, organizing, um, helping others succeed. Part of being a leader is not your success, it's everyone on the team's success. You're successful by enabling your team. You know, you, you do things, you help people do things. Be that utility person, um, be competent, be reliable. That's, that's a great way to establish a sense of leadership in a, in a group without having to be the outgoing charismatic leader who's charging at the front, you know. Um, you know, leaders just really build success in a team, not in themselves. You know, you make yourself successful and others will understand your part in it. Uh, the person that writes the most lines of code is not the leader of the team. So, mentors, who needs them? You do, I do, everybody does. One of the things I think helped me the most is most of my major jobs, you know, where, at least where it wasn't my own company, um, I had somebody who I could talk to, the person that was a sounding board. You know, so a, a good leader talks to you and a good leader listens to you. You know, some, you need somebody that you can ask questions of. You need somebody who's gonna ask you potentially difficult questions and make you rethink things, see something from a different perspective. Um, mentors don't need to be technical just because you're technical. Um, the tech part is easy. You know, we know what computers are going to do. If we put this in, we're going to get this out. People are hard. You know, mentors should help you deal with people, not just technical issues. You know, somebody could teach you how to be a great programmer, but if they can't help you um, navigate society, navigate business, navigate human relationships, th then you need somebody like that. That's the type of mentor you need to look for. And, and mentors don't have to be somebody that has, you know, seniority over you or has even age over you. You know, I, I've, I've had people that I considered mentors that were younger than me. Um, I've had people that I considered mentors that were peers. You know, it, it's, it's someone who can provide support for you and everybody needs a mentor. So, or multiple mentors. So, but I suggest that you, you consider carefully, you know, when you get into a new situation, hopefully you get into the job world soon after school, find a nice job, identify people that are going to help you grow. Uh, career choice. So at this point in time, um, you guys probably have a pretty good idea of what you'd like to do for a living. Um, but you may not necessarily have an idea of where you want to do it. So. When, when you get out there and you start looking for jobs, you know, um, you can be a, a programmer, or you can be a network engineer, or you can be an infrastructure engineer. What You can do all these things at a lot of different places, but where you do it impacts your potential growth. So what I'm saying is, in addition to loving what you do, because, I mean, hopefully you didn't take a, a pick a major at Drexel for something that you, you're disinterested in. If you wanna have real staying power, love what you do, but then you wanna find a path that's gonna sustain you. Um, and I mean that's financially, um, emotionally, you know, intellectually, you, know, you don't want to stagnate. For me, uh, I'm in my 50s, I'm still looking for new coding concepts, still trying to be on the, the cutting edge, still working, I'm doing things on my couch in the evening just to learn. You know, find something that drives you. I, I don't hate going to work. I love going to work. I love my job. I love the company I work for. I found the right place. Um, and so pick your, choose your options, choose your career, choose your companies, choose them with real thought. You know, make sure that it's going to give you valuable experience and it's going to give you options, you know, because you don't want to be that person that said, you know what, when I grow up, I'm going to work for my space. Because the, the tech world isn't permanent. You know, things rise, things fall. There, there are sites that are really hot right now that could disappear tomorrow. It's, you have to be flexible. So you want to pick a career that gives you options, places to grow. And maybe you find out, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you know what? I really like managing people. Or I really like the business side of this stuff. Think about that and spend time thinking about it and make sure that you're giving yourself options and you're not pigeonholing yourself. Job hopping. So I think this is one thing that 
people don't talk enough about. And when, when I'm talking to my employees, and um, this is a subject I bring up a lot, not because I'm trying to discourage them from job hopping. So often I'm trying to encourage them to job hop. So in the IT world, it is often difficult to make significant jumps up in your career without changing companies. Um, salary policies get in the way, seniority gets in the way, optics get in the way. And sometimes the best way to move forward is to move on. It's just how it is. And I, I've told many an employee that, I was like, you know what? This is your time, you, you, you need to make the move. I, I can't give you what you need now. But I will say is don't move too soon. Um, if, if you're considering you know, getting a new job every year, there's probably a problem somewhere. And as a person who's hired over 100 people in my career, if I see job hopping you know, year after year, that's a serious red flag. And maybe other people see it differently. But for me, that's a real red flag. Two years for, to stay at a job before moving on, especially um, people your age, I think that's, that's fine. Um, three years, nobody is gonna bat an eyelash at three years at a job before moving on, especially in IT. Um, but one other thing I wanna say is know when you've found a good place. So um, when I got to Penn Mutual almost eight years ago, um, you know, it, it took a while to settle in, figure out, you know, projects were in flux and stuff. I came on as a consultant for the first six months before I got hired. Um, but I wasn't there a year and a half, two years before I knew I had found my last job. Now, of course, I'm older, so my last job is uh, still might have been my eighth job. But know when you've got a good thing, right? And, you know, Penn Mutual was that thing for me. Um, I've been very upwardly mobile, you would say. I've kind of gotten the promotions. I've gotten the additional responsibility, the teams. Um, it's been a really good place. So don't think that moving on is the only way. You know, sometimes corporations are a little slow. There's a lot of gears, a lot of things to, to be wound up before something can happen. And sometimes it doesn't happen at all. But what I'm saying is know when you're in a good place and um, take advantage of it. So um, Chelsea had forwarded some questions to me uh, ahead of time um, based on, I guess, my background. So I, I thought I would just answer a few of those before we uh, open up to um, any, dis any questions you guys might have. So somebody asked what it was like to be a chief technology officer. So I was um, CTO for a financial services company. Um, we did streaming media for, um, IPO roadshows, uh, shareholder meetings, things like that. A lot of Wall Street work. Um, and being CTO is great because you get to make a lot of really fun decisions. Um, the downside is um, you have to make a lot of decisions and sometimes they're wrong and you know, it all rolls up to you. So it's a, it's a great position, but sometimes you get a little bit elevated beyond um, actually doing things um, and you're just picking things. But it's still, it was a great experience, a great learning experience for me. Um, which changes in the software industry have I noticed? Um, so as a lifelong software developer, most of my, most of the things I've noticed have been more in that um, world. So for me, the, the single biggest thing over the past um, four decades has been the rise of the integrated development environment. Um, it, it took us from going with, you know, little text-based editors and compiling things into um, having something that has lots of information built into the application for development. You know, I, I don't think I could work today if I wasn't using um, IntelliJ or WebStorm. Um, you know, and I started with Turbo Pascal was the first ID I ever used back in the day. That uh, was a great thing. Um, another thing, um, the long, long ago rise of object oriented programming was a big thing in the industry and more recently uh, functional programming. I think functional programming is not come even close to peaking yet, you're gonna see a lot more of that. Uh, distributed computing, I think, was a big trend. Um, no one, if you'd gone back to um, you know, the, the 70s, no one was going to guess that everybody's gonna have a computer on their desk, let alone in their hand, and that these things called web browsers were gonna be running applications for us. Um, 
distributed computing in that sense has really been uh, amazing and it, it goes along with the the rise of the web and of course javascript with it um things that didn't pan out um that people thought were going to be huge um so thin clients was a term back in the um late 90s you know the idea was everyone was just going to have this something akin to a chromebook i guess and it's, google's still trying to do it um but a, a not very powerful computer that just gave you the UI and the, um, you know, the keyboard and the mouse and that kind of thing. Um, it's kind of like what you see in the back of uh, airplanes, you know, these little devices that, um, back of the seats of the airplanes, like these devices that run applications and stuff like that. That was supposed to be the real big thing and people weren't gonna have real computing power on their desk or whatever. And that, that totally never happened. And speaking of never happening, um, visual coding. Uh, if you know Steve Jobs and his company NextGen, you know, if you were to listen to them back then, um, we were going to be doing things like dragging and dropping components together and building applications without writing a line of code, which still does not happen. Um, sure, MIT has some stuff for you know for kids for teaching the basics or whatever, but you know, visual coding is really not a, a major thing. So, um, lastly, I got how do you handle stress? Um, for me, I had some rough corporate experiences in my 20s that um, were really bad. And from that point forward, everything else seemed like a piece of cake. Uh, I guess the, the key to handling stress is um, scale. Knowing that, you know, this project not getting done is not the end of the world. People might be unhappy. It, it might be uncomfortable. But things that happen in the real world are, are much more stressful. Pandemics are stressful. You know, this I find stressful. I, I don't find my job stressful. So, um, with that, um, Chelsea wants to take over and um, you know open things up for any questions you might have. So, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We also have a very intimate group, so if you want to say your question, I can unmute you. Um, so, just let me know either way, whatever you feel comfortable with. So that also is an opportunity if you want to introduce yourself, um, students, and let us know, you know, your major, feel free to do that as well. Um, That'd be great. Want to, you know, give you all that opportunity if you're comfortable. Um, but while you're thinking of questions, uh, one question I did have from your conversation was, you've mentioned about leadership in that um, personal touch and going to someone's office. Do you have any advice? Um, I know before we got started, you mentioned working remote for a number of years on building that personal touch in this remote setting. Yeah. Um, so one of the things when, when, when uh, in the pandemic situation here, when Penn Mutual, I guess it was um, mid February shut down and you know, the home offices and everyone went remote. One of the things I kept driving to my people is use, use your tools, right? use zooms. Like if you have a question, you, Hit, hit me up as if you were walking over to my desk. I think people need to maintain that face-to-face -face relationship, that, that presence to stay connected to their job. Um, I, I think relationships are the key to successful IT. I, I really think that you know, we're not building these things for the future you know, robot overlords. We're building these things for people. And you know, people require handling and discussions communication and you know so building relationships is really how you get things done in it and i and i think you know, in a situation like this you have to continue to use all the tools you have everything that the technology is providing to you to maintain relationships so we do have questions um so the first one is did you see any programming language that was famous for a while that no one um currently uses and then after that um i'll unmute uh, emmanuel Okay, so um, the language is still around. I mean, a few languages um, truly go away. I mean, heck, we still have COBOL developers in, in our company because of the mainframe. But the one that stands out for me that I actually used for a while um, is um, I used Lisp for a while. Um, so I was actually on a, a co-op, a Drexel co-op, um, and I was working on naval missile systems and developing in Lisp. Um, it was kind of a thing back then, and um, now it's a more of a scholarly type language. It's, it's influenced a lot of 
um, application Kappa application development programming languages. Um, you know, the functional programming that Lisp had back then was was just worlds different than everything else. Um, but I think Lisp is a pretty good example. Um, you can talk about DBase, RBase, and some of the um, you know early database languages before SQL was a big thing. Um, those were pretty significant back in the day too. Okay, and Emmanuel, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hello, my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity major at Drexel, and I actually have two questions. Number one is, uh, what is your bachelor's and what is your uh, master's degree? <laughs> so this is a really simple um, question to answer. I have neither of those. Um, so I I was a serial entrepreneur, so I, I never. I never finished school. Uh, you got to understand back in the day, you know, so I graduated high school in 86. I set up, personally set up the networks in my high school and my junior high. You know, th things weren't the way they are now. There was, wasn't this big infrastructure in the schools. So um, I started at Carnegie Mellon, transferred to uh, Drexel, and then I, I, I left and I started companies <laughs> so uh, i'm not not encouraging any of you to do that the world is a much different place now it's very hard to get far in the it world um without having that degree now but you know i'm a lot older than you guys and things were different then and my second question is can you explain your career path to becoming a cto so like what jobs have you held that um taught you or how to become a CEO or that led you to become a CTO? So, um, so right now uh, I'm not Penn Mutual CTO. I'm the, um, you know, director of web development, but it's a much larger company. The company I was a CTO for, we had about 150 people, but how I got there was I ran my own successful um, consulting firm for uh, about six years. So for, for me, it was starting out with uh, a couple of initial clients and then, you know, eventually worked my way up to about 25 staff, um, you know, serving a lot of clients and branching out into some other, um, some other fields, a little, even a little bit of marketing, advertising, stuff like that, and um, sold my company. And when I sold my company, then I started shopping around, you know, my skills and, you know, I'm a pretty techie guy, but I had a pretty business aspect to me as well and um and i think for a job like cto um, and even more so for cio it, you have to understand business you have to understand people and um you know I, you need to be able to you know be in the developer's cave with with the guys who are coding and then you need to be able to walk in the boardroom with everybody there and and explain what's going on um so i i think flexibility and um you know, working on both sides of the of the, the line, you know, both the tech world and the business world is an absolute requirement to get to the highest levels of IT. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure thing. I apologize for the bad lighting where I am. It's getting very stormy out. And it was quite bright here when we started. It's getting really dark now. So <laughs> hey, there's a yeah, there's a thunderstorm coming through on my end too. We do have another question. Um, did you have to constantly learn new technology? I am constantly learning new technologies. Absolutely. Um, people ask me, you know, it's like, oh, when do you think you're gonna retire? I'm like, when I'm dead. Um, I I I I can't. If, if I were to retire, I would simply have to start another company. Um, I, I need that, that scratch that, that mental itch. I am constantly looking at, um, focusing primarily on the web world now, but like, you know, if, you, if you're a JavaScript, JavaScript developer, you know, ES6 and, you know, the new language extensions and things that are there or new build tools or, you know, used to do a lot of work in Angular and then, you know, React and, you know, all sorts of things constantly constantly moving forward and even you know my free time robotics it has nothing to do with my job but i like building little tanks you know it, it you know the microprocessors arduino um, raspberry pis those kind of things all super fun so always learning new things and you might not think that you know being able to make a robot arm move around and do stuff is is you know very valuable for a guy who heads up web development but it's still 
always building your skill in terms of being able to break down problems and understand ways to address problems and you know how code works and how logic works so i think you you're in the wrong industry if you're not looking to learn new things all the time and then any um any other questions from the audience I did have a question around hiring and how students can stand out. I know you mentioned you've hired a number of people um, in your career. Mm -hmm. Any advice on that? So um, I think you'll get mixed um, mixed thoughts on these things. But personally, I like cover letters. But uh, I can I can sniff out a canned cover letter from a mile away. You know, if you my, my recommendation would be to write something specific to the the company you're um, applying to and make a customized resume. I mean, especially, you know, maybe early on now, it's like you're just coming right out of school. There's only so many ways to say the same thing. Um, but as you start developing your skills and your career builds, tailor your resumes to your audience. Um, it's just like technology in general. It's relationships and it's knowing your audience. You know, um, every little detail is not significant. So give me that one page thing it says i've done this 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 and this and these are the things that matter to me right another question um how did you manage to keep up with everything um there's new there are new technologies or new things coming out every day and sometimes it can feel overwhelming so i guess how do you focus on what new technology to learn um i think that's what we're getting at with this question so, oh, the storm is hitting really hard right here. I hope we don't lose power. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, for, for, for me, I, I, I've always been an IT generalist. Um, and that, that worked pretty well back, you know, you go back a couple of decades. Um, pretty adaptable. You know, I, I could I build out networks, uh, telecom systems, all sorts of stuff. But as the world has gotten more advanced and technology has gotten much more specific. I have definitely slimmed down and I started focusing more on web technologies, um, even to the point where you, I'm, I'm no longer really using Java, um, just focusing on JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and you know, frameworks associated with web applications. Um, it's hard. Um, and I, I can only, stay as broad as you can while still being very very competent in one specific thing i think i think that's the you know again going back to what i said before have options i have i have a lot of options um, but i've been doing this a long time you guys coming out of school are going to have fewer options initially um so go with uh, this might sound a little little dumb but go with the safer bets i think um you know pick things that you know are going to be around the web's not going away you know, wireless technology, probably not going away. We're not going to go back to cables, right? Um, so think of it pragmatically like that. Uh, and then just a last call for questions. I know, oh, uh, I'll unmute you, Emmanuel. Um, you look, you have one more question. So I, I don't know how to formulate this question, but I'm going to try my best. So it's, what's the best way or the most, um, sure way to become a chief or a CIO or a CISO or anything like that? Like, should you first be a pen tester and then IT director or something like this? Or, or will the company just see you work hard and they'll just put you in that position? Cause that's what I've been wondering and I'm not really sure um, on that. Uh, Michael, uh don't know it looks like you might have froze yeah um, i think you froze yeah. uh, but we'll see if we'll give him a another minute or two to see if he hopefully. yeah definitely <laughs> um yeah i'm definitely experiencing a, a major thunderstorm where i'm at too so where are you i'm in west philly oh you're in philly okay okay mm -hmm. okay oh, well, hopefully he can come back oh no he's out yeah. Okay. Let's see if he'll rejoin us. I know he said he didn't have a hard stop, but we'll give him um, we'll give him a few more minutes to see if he can come back.
Yeah, it's definitely a, a major, major storm. Like, is it like a tropical storm or? I think it's just like a thunder, not thunderstorm, but oh, okay. you can hear the wind. <laughs> All right. right. And Amelia, where are you calling from? Uh, well, I actually go to school in Drexel, you know, in Philadelphia, but um, because of the coronavirus, uh, me and my family decided that I should just come to Florida for a whole month and just, you know, stay here with my other family. So I'm in Florida right now. Yeah, it definitely doesn't compare to a, a, a hurricane or anything like that. But yeah, in all the calls that I've been on, I'm trying to ask people, students, where are they calling in from? Because um, I know you all are all over the place now. So Yeah. Oh, uh, one person's from Vietnam, or he's in Vietnam. He put it in the chat. Yeah. And if, um, I think it's Chi or your name. Um, if you want to, I can unmute you if you want to say hello um, and connect with us as well while we're hopefully waiting. Okay. Um, it looks like there might be this storm. Um, he might be out for like his connection completely. Um, so okay. I'll connect with him separately and see um, if he feels comfortable, like best way to connect if it's LinkedIn or email and share that contact with you all. Um, give it like another minute or two and then we'll we'll wrap up. Don't want to hold you all too long. Um, okay, no problem. But yeah, we'll, we'll give him another minute to see if he can get back on. Okay, yep. Lost his power. He just mentioned. Uh, I'll oh, he just mentioned. Okay. Yeah, um, he, yeah, he got back to me. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, really appreciate you all taking the time to get to know, um, Mike and his experience at Penn Neutral and, um, I'll, I'll let you know the best way to connect with them moving forward. So be safe and be well.